Welcome back to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. Today I'm interviewing Ms. Sarah Chaco with the Wall Street Journal from New York and very pleased to have her as our guest here at Campbellsville University. Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I'm very honored to be Tell here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I am a online producer for the Wall Street Journal. And, and as you said, I'm in New York. I started with the journal while I was in D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working there with the Pro Financial Regulation team, which is based in D.C. And that job sort of morphed into uh, and got kind of um, combined with another team. Most production for the Wall Street Journal happens in New York or one of the international mm -hmm. offices, but we ha keep it kind of headquartered. So they said, if you want to stay in production, uh, go ahead and see if you can make it in, in the Big Apple. So that's where I, I've headed off to now. How does the online uh, readership and, and use or consumption of the Wall Street Journal compare to the traditional hold it in the hand and not hold that hard newspaper? in your hand, yeah. the traditional paper. I think we have, um, I should probably check this, but we have, it's, it's about balance. It's okay. about 50-50 and, and we've worked really hard to get our online readership up mm -hmm. to meet, and it, as a kind of established legacy, one of these legacy papers, mm -hmm. we do still enjoy, and we're very focused um, on our print edition. Uh, we haven't let that lapse or, or tried to move too fast onto online. But we are um, doing a lot more with our mobile offerings too, mm -hmm. iPad and and um, your phone. What's the app itself? And so um, yeah, we are we're kind of dedicated a, a lot to both. And I think that's a pretty uh, for subscribers. It's about fifty fifty, as mm -hmm. I understand. I think just recently too, they started giving the college discount for online subscriptions. Right. And I think that was a kind of a a big turning point, at least I see it as such, for new readership mm -hmm. and making sure that the next generation of readers are engaged on whatever platform they like, but knowing that print is kind of um, dying out a little bit, it's going to be shrinking and advertising dollars certainly with it in that way. Um, but then again, you have advertising online, it's just a matter of figuring out what's the mm -hmm. best uh, mix and revenue balance. For well, as I was mentioning before we came on the air, I read about or look at, uh, review five papers a day, mm -hmm. all of them online, and the Wall Street Journal is one of them, and I get that educational discount. Oh, great. I okay. use my EDU uh, uh, we, uh, email address, email yeah. address so I get the educator's academic uh, discount. Excellent. But uh, what prompted you to become a journalist? Um, it is kind of funny. I fell into journalism myself. Uh, I actually went to undergrad as a biochemistry major. I was doing well in the sciences. And I had grown up watching um, Peter Jennings mm -hmm. on ABC News and my parents subscribed to Newsweek and the local paper. Mm -hmm. And so news was around me. I just didn't, and I, I had a strong writing background, but I didn't think of it as a career. I thought you could be an author. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any reporters. I saw, and you know, I'm not really close with TV personalities or anything like that. It just seemed like a different world. And um, so I went into biochemistry, and it didn't go <laughs> super well for me. Mm -hmm. And as I was sort of, um, there was one uh, semester that I was just trying to find a different avenue, sure. and eventually I went to photojournalism. And then I took a media law course, mm -hmm. and that just changed my perspective on the importance of um, the First Amendment, mm. the freedom of press, the ability to have a free flow of information and to communicate and to be the eyes and ears of the public when they're not able to be there themselves. And um, I, al I thought about going into media law briefly after undergrad, but ultimately decided to go into reporting and tell, try to tell the stories of people on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, now you've been with some other publications uh, in addition to the Wall Street Journal. Some of those are uh, well known. Yeah, yeah, a few. Um, and especially, I guess, in the DC circle, mm -hmm. some of them better than others. I started at some small town papers in mm -hmm. Texas and then um, eventually moved into uh, to Louisiana where I covered the state capitol there for The Advocate. And um, which is the main paper in Baton Rouge. And then um, decided to go to grad school for a year because I was concerned I wasn't fully equipped for mm -hmm. new media, online media. 
And then that took me, a fellowship took me to DC and I eventually got a job with Federal Times. It's part of like the Defense News Network, okay. or at the time it was, so Army Times, Navy Times. They had a federally federal employee focused publication called Federal Times. I covered government contracts. And then um, I got a job, the longest, possibly the longest job in DC I had was at Congressional Quarterly, mm -hmm. which our uh, tagline was influencing the influential. And that was um, a well-known paper on the Hill, right. um, sister publication is Roll Call. But when you're outside of DC, you don't, people are like, oh, what is that? But I'm familiar with okay, that. Okay, good. <laughs> and I did, I covered the Senate floor mm -hmm. for uh, that publication. And then eventually there I moved into production did um, co-wrote a newsletter, their morning briefing newsletter, and um, helped with their social media, the at CQ now, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun. And okay. then uh, I ended up at the Hill for a brief stint. They were trying a new pro publication mm -hmm. that um, didn't pan out, but luckily right before that ended, the Wall Street Journal picked okay. me up. Now, how has the profession of journalism changed during your career? And you've touched on that a bit, Yeah. but more detailed. How, sure. how has the change occurred? Oh, hu huge changes, I think. Uh, I mentioned the Baton Rouge paper, and that paper, a small town paper, um, well, Baton Rouge is a big place. It feels like a small town, even though you're covering the state capital, mm -hmm. because it's a very tight-knit community. It's for uh, federal workers as well as the community at large. But at the time, their idea of, um, of having an online presence was at midnight, they would update the website with all the stories that were gonna be in print mm. the next day. They don't wanna compete with their own print product, right? right? So um, that terrified me, because at the same time, I was hearing of colleagues in Texas who were becoming mojos, mobile journalists, one man bands, mm. one woman bands, uh, taking a camera and a laptop and your phone and just going where the story is and producing there on site. And I thought, I'm gonna get so left behind. Also at that time, it was the Louisiana was the first place I covered a congressional campaign with um, the colleague, uh, our congressional reporter in DC. So I was in Louisiana and he was in DC and sometimes he'd come down and help me over, and. But we weren't on Twitter at that time. I didn't have a Twitter handle, mm -hmm. wasn't following any of the candidates on Twitter. So even that progression was just, you've seen all these things change. Now being online and be, having an online first story is considered having a scoop. You know, you can, and you don't have to worry about undermining your print product. You can get the next iteration, the next update via your paper if you mm -hmm. want to. So, so publications don't feel like they're competing against themselves in that way. Now we have Twitter and Facebook and have this access to politicians and what they're gonna say mm -hmm. when you're not around or when people aren't near them or where are they now? Mm -hmm. You know, you can follow and track these politicians in, in real time and it's just completely changed how, how we report. You, you've uh, had some extraordinary uh, experience uh, obviously in small town as well as at the national level than what in DC and now New York City. Uh, but you mentioned the small town in Texas. Mm -hmm. What were some of the positive uh, aspects of working at that level in, in a small town? Oh, you you get access to um, your community leaders, mm -hmm. the leaders that, and people, people who, and I felt this way in Louisiana too, um, people who are going to be affected by policies that are being implemented mm -hmm. by their local and state government, but also federally. They read the papers and they know sure. what's happening on the federal level and it trickles down and they want to know where that money, and especially say in a natural disaster, where the money is going to come from, when is it going to get here, who's helping us out. Um, but more by and large you realize that the state and local governments and their own issues, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have all the kind of um, big news issues that are going on in DC are just are just kind of in the ether around you. They mm -hmm. might impact you, they might come down, especially funding, but by and large, it's your local and state government that's affecting your day-to-day -day life. And then you, and you can see these uh, constituent groups, um, special interest groups coming to City Hall, coming to the mm -hmm. Capitol, um, sitting in the committee rooms, testifying as witnesses, and then you as a reporter have access to them as well. Mm -hmm. So I felt like you had a much closer sense of, of who is really being impacted by this story right. um, that you don't kind of always get in DC. The other part of it is, um, especially when I was in Colleen uh, and Denton covering education, you get to report on the fun stuff. Like yeah. I 
covered a dog show, you know, yeah. and that was, it was silly, but it was, and a Native American powwow, and um, it, in education, I, one of the most commented stories, I think still to this day, now granted, I haven't gone back to look at how stories did online with online comments, but in terms of like emails I received and letters writing in, was about a group of, I forget if they were like fourth or fifth grade middle school girls who had found a frog that another group of boys had treated very badly, had broken its back legs. Mm -hmm. They created a contraption for this frog to get gain mobility and the frog was using it. And people love that story, you mm -hmm. know? And um, as much as I wrote about test scores and what your school board was doing, that story people, mm -hmm we're so happy to see and happy to see that kind of reporting. So There's more cool. room perhaps for positive reporting? There is. Human interest reporting? A lot more room. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do a fair amount of that mm -hmm. uh, at the Journal too um, and at other papers I've worked for, mostly at, at larger papers or papers that have some sort of like human interest feature section. But I do think it's a little bit harder to find sometimes. Mm -hmm. You are having to flip through past all the Polit political news and business news and world news. Oh, and there's your feature section. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're right, at a smaller paper, you can put that maybe up front and have something a little bit more. And and in turn, those regular stories or those the stories about local politics. You you do have um, the ability to put a, a human voice to mm -hmm. it. But I know papers are trying to do better with that, even with their comment section, trying to make it a more engaged discussion as opposed to just letting whoever wants to talk, talk. You mm -hmm. know? And Louisiana, how long were you there? And were there particular challenges in Louisiana? Um, Louisiana's like, kind of like Kentucky. It, it, it has its issues, yeah. images, <laughs> yeah. perhaps not all po uh, positive around the country. And that's a huge, I think, challenge for states like that to shake the negative imagery of even just decades, mm -hmm. um, you know, Huey Long's presence. People right. still talk about him. He still has his shadow is still there and literally because I think there's that monument to him in mm -hmm. the gardens. And so um, it was a, it was more fun than a challenge, I thought, but the challenges of being at a, uh, in the Capitol or in a space like that is um, the same as what you would see, honestly, on the Hill. Is, uh, politicians wanting to be very careful about what they say and how they say it, um, but I think you have a lot more ability, you have a better ability of getting close to your politicians and mm -hmm. having them see you um, as a part of the solution instead mm -hmm. of as a part of the problem. Uh, the challenge, some of the challenges there, as I mentioned earlier, were um, that market could become sort of a bubble mm -hmm. if you don't have a lot of good competition. And unfortunately, the Times-Picune scaled back its coverage into to focus more on New Orleans, that kind of left the advocate to its own devices. So it's really up to its readers to push for changes at that paper if they're not happening organically or out of the good of the public interest. Um, and you know, other challenges there uh, were just the innumerable problems that any state, but especially some of these states in the South have. So I did a series on poverty, for mm -hmm. example, and um, trying to put a number on how much money state the state funneled into programs to address poverty, mm -hmm. well then you start realizing poverty is so connected to uh, other things like education right. and healthcare. That became a challenge. I think that would have been a challenge in a lot of places, but for a state that is seen as high poverty and what does all that lead to and who wants to talk about it and who doesn't, and so that could become mm -hmm. a challenge. Across the country, we've seen uh, to, to an extent the decline of those regional daily papers, yeah, exactly. like the one in Louisiana, here in Kentucky, the Courier Journal in Louisville, the Herald Leader in Lexington bought out by chains, mm. uh, laying off a retirement of those writers that have been there a long time, less and less direct reporting in state, mm -hmm. and more and more uh, stories from uh, AP or, mm -hmm. or whatever connection or from the chain they're a part of. Uh, has that led to a decline, you think, in the quality of reporting and the decline of the connection between those papers and uh, the states in which are the regional territories in which they report? I would think so. I wouldn't say 
quality because I think it, it's different. But, but certainly there is something missing when you don't have a regional reporter reporting mm -hmm. for you. It's mm -hmm. like not having a, your local TV personality that's kind of yours, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways when you hear people talk about or there's like this um, feeling of the media, the media elite, um, us being, I think it's because of, of trends like that. You don't have a face that you can, or a, per, a voice that you feel is speaking for you or asking questions on your behalf at the Capitol or at the state, mm -hmm. um, in the state house. And so I, I do think that has led to a feeling of disconnect from the media. And, um, you know, for a while, I remember, um, what is it, Patch? Uh, Patch, uh, w they had tried to kind of restart these mm -hmm. small, and there was a lot of problems like that. It's not a, an easy endeavor, uh, right. journalism, but even publishing and trying to mass produce uh, communications online. It's a challenge of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you become susceptible to advertising and what information you're willing to sell. and. Um, and so it's a hard balance, and I, I feel like it has, at the very least, hurt the media's relationship with the public. And um, I don't know what can be done to remedy that mm -hmm. other than bringing someone, investing in local media, mm -hmm. keeping these regional papers alive, because they really, truly are, I think, very important. And, and we've seen it even in the decline of the small town like Campbellsville, uh, twice a week paper now down to once a week mm -hmm. and much thinner than it used to be, downsized in, you know, in terms of length and width and then downsized in number of pages, downsized mm -hmm. in local reporting. And uh, Kentucky really has no, many people would say we have no statewide paper now. Wow. The Courier okay. would still claim to be, but you could make an argument uh, that they're really not. Yeah. They're more metro you know, with a few stories from Frankfurt and, and you know, an AP section that uh, has a few uh, stories from around the state. Yes, and I think that is a struggle for uh, newspapers to have a broad base mm -hmm. to send reporters across the state. Even the AP struggles with that. I know in some, some states, uh, multiple states, they mm -hmm. have one reporter that right. has to cover everything. In some ways, it might be good in that um, the paper then has to really focus on what's the important news. Clearly, what the b downside is you're not getting the fullest mm -hmm. news on a day-to-day -day basis, and right. changes might be happening day-to-day. -day. Um, I'm gonna. I feel like I keep going back and forth, but the other side of that is I do feel like the constant immediacy of media thing and sources like, or uh, platforms like Twitter um, have given politicians the sense that they need to say something mm -hmm. new every day, and right. for us to think that there is something new to be said every day. I don't think that's always true, mm -hmm. and I think um, sometimes I feel like this on Washington, there's this feed the beast mentality. I gotta say something new today, and we pick apart those statements. The slightest difference can become the source of a, you know, a mm -hmm. story itself, mm -hmm. when ultimately down the line, very little is changing overall. And so you kinda need to be mindful of that. I would also hope that we as uh, journalists find ways to still be journalists in our and, and foster communication in our own communities so that we might help other people to um, to be kind of on their own little journalists and their mm -hmm. own microcosm of, of the world. The flip the downside to that is who do you trust? Right. How do you know where um, verified information is? Journalists hold themselves to a high standard. We um, we have journalistic standards. It's not an oath that we take, but um, there have been talks of trying to do something mm -hmm. like that so that people feel like this is a trusted source, they're going to put their biases aside in order to tell me this story or present this information in the uh, fairest p way possible. We've gone from uh, the day, as you mentioned, Peter Jennings. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go back even further to Walter Cronkite, <laughs> those highly regarded, trusted spokespersons of the evening news for 30 minutes and you, you, you sat and took their every word as gospel truth. Yeah. And, and for the most part they were. They were pretty accurate mm -hmm. in their reporting. To, to now we no longer have daily press briefings in the mm -hmm. White House mm -hmm. for the most part. And when they are they're more shouting matches than they are briefings. Uh, and we we see the president, no criticism uh, intended, but but 
his going out to get in the helicopter and, and, sh and, and a shouting match with back and forth. And I, I, we were talking about this before we came on the air. I particularly think this president loves to banner with the media. While he attacks the media, the media actually has great access to President Trump. More yes. access than many presidents have given the press. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way. Definitely. And then we have a president who ran for president and now who, who maintains press relations via Twitter. Mm -hmm. Then we have this just avalanche of, as you, uh, social media platforms and other news reporting entities. How does the general public contend with all that? It, how how, how do, does the average person listening or watching the show know what is true and what is not true? It is hard. I, I imagine it is very hard for the public, just given the number of new sources of mm -hmm. information and they change every day, and you have people who, just because uh, one of their tweets go viral, is now considered an informal mm -hmm. pundit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, it's hard even for me. And I, I think it just you have to take a step back. You um, do have to figure out what it is about a person that makes them trustworthy. Just like everything else, why do you go to a certain doctor or mm -hmm. to a certain grocery store? It has what you want, it has it at a fair price, it um, has a variety, but also you trust what's coming out of there and what, mm -hmm. what you're being given. Um, I think it's the same for sources of media. And I, and I say that knowing that in some ways I might be undermining my own industry, but there are other people out there. First of all, there's a number of good media sources. Mm -hmm. um, so please rely on the media that's there because they take their jobs very seriously and we see it in this environment, we see what's happening in this environment and we take it even more seriously. Mm -hmm. We want to be on these platforms and we try very hard to convey uh, the news as it is in multiple m ways so that people don't feel left out there floating. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other sources for information. Go, you can go directly to the source. The Pew, um, sent, you know, Pew mm -hmm. Research in DC, for instance, or even CQ, um, in some ways with its vote tracking system, they have resources in which you can, and they're resource rich, they're, um, they have data, they're data rich, that you can access on your own through reports mm -hmm. or through the, uh, the systems that are available. Sometimes you do have to pay for it, um, but a lot of times, eventually, some of this data will become free or reported mm -hmm. on and analyzed. Um, so you have to go to the source sometimes. And this, just the same way you would uh, vet anybody else that enters your life. You know, look at their, hi what, have, what is their history? Um, what have they said that, and a, a student brought this up in a, in a class earlier today, has like a, you, you need like two sources to verify. Mm. So say CNN is reporting something and Fox News reports the same thing, that's a pretty good bet that mm -hmm. they're right, right, that they're on the same page. So or at least like are seeing the same mm -hmm. thing and reporting the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, but you, all, I have noticed as well that journalists are getting a lot of pushback by what, what I could, you know, a tweet that sort of, here's an example, a tweet that um, one reporter was uh, commenting at, uh, at a um, event that Hillary Clinton was at, Cory Booker spoke, their interaction of coming off stage, and, and then Bernie Sanders spoke, and his re interaction with uh, Hillary Clinton was more chilly, and was that a characterization? Was mm -hmm. that him just telling you what he saw? And, but then another reporter reported kind of the same thing, and, mm -hmm. and you have to wonder, is that in and of itself newsworthy? What is it telling you? draw your own conclusions, but a reporter who kind of sets it out there for you and lets you pick up the pieces, I think that's better than, than not would having it, it would, would it be fair to say, Sarah, that we need to be leery somewhat of news reporting via pure social media, Facebook and Twitter type sources versus more established media sources? Let me give you a quick example without taking up valuable time here in Kentucky. We were, this whole state's been thrown in an uproar, as well as the nation, over the young man from Covington Catholic High School yeah. in the face-off with the Native American representative at uh, the Mon National Monument, the Washington Monument, uh, following a National Right to Life uh, a, a rally that the young man and his uh, colleagues 
and and we we've been given about a dozen different interpretations of what was going on there mm -hmm. and and depending on one's political uh, uh, orientation depends on where you stand and who was at fault mm -hmm. in that particular confrontation and people have taken it for the gospel the social the different varying social media uh, entries rather than sitting back and watching some positive or, or more objective news reporting on that situation. It is hard not to get wrapped up in the commentary that comes mm -hmm. online. And that's what I'm saying. It's you have to be judicious in your sources and what's in your feed. Try not to have the universe come into your mm. feed because you will be overwhelmed by it. Um, and, and yeah, and I think as you saw, as the reporting as things were unraveled, and it was because people were actually, I saw this other uh, you know, angle of it, actually there were these people over here, and as more mm -hmm. sources of information came right. to light, then the reporting becomes fuller, then we can go and vet other sources mm -hmm. and see and tell a greater story. Mm -hmm. But you kinda, if you just dive in and get that snapshot from that moment in time, you're doing yourself a disservice, mm -hmm. the story evolves. Right. Do you think that we face serious threats to our First Amendment rights? in this country? I would hope not. I know a lot, I know as we, as I mentioned earlier, the relationship between the press and the public has become um, tenuous, but uh, I think there is a lot of people who still very much and on a, a lot of levels appreciate our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And I think if I go back and, and if everybody could go back and take a look at it through a media law textbook, you'll find there are other countries where information is restricted and we don't want to be like The First Amendment is precious. Very. Uh, and, and without it, we're in a deep trouble. Yes, and I think people will Sarah Chaco, that. thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so on much. On your travels. Thank you for Thanks coming for to Campbellsville. Me. John yeah. Chowning with Sarah Chaco thanking her and the Wall Street Journal for allowing her to be with us at Campbellsville University and thanking you for being with us for Dialogue on Public Issues.